Good evening, everybody, and welcome testing, to testing. Testing. Hold on, John. Hello. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Trasnater. Today, we're coming to you from the beautiful Saint Joseph's Church in Sailor Town, Belfast, and we're joined by Reclaim the Enlightenment. So, today is a virtual pamphlet launch by Philip R. So, I'm going to hand you over to Reclaim the Enlightenment's Chairman John Gray. Okay, John, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have just risen from something that Terry tells me is the bishop's chair. Well, the, the bishop fled, um, and we are now here as Reclaim the Enlightenment. Uh, I'm sure the bishop would normally have got a bigger congregation than we have tonight, but we've got a very select congregation of advanced thinkers and enlightened people, and so much the better. It, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the, the launch of Philip Orr's pamphlet on Francis Hutchison. Uh, I should say Philip has been a good friend of Reclaim the Enlightenment. He was one of the founding members of the committee. I wouldn't like to say that he has actually fled the country but he is now located in England. Um, and so this, I'm here in reality, but Philip is here virtually, but it's great to make the connection back with Philip, who was very influential uh, in the first few years of Reclaim the Enlightenment on numerous occasions when I took the head staggers and tried to do something really dangerous and ill-advised, Philip was there as an advisor to say, hold your horses, think again, read it again, and just see what a class of nonsense you're making of yourself. And the advice was well taken. Well, what about Francis Hutchison? Why would we make a big deal of Francis Hutchison? Uh, very few people around here have made any deal of Francis Hutchison for well over a century, uh, and yet, <clears throat> um, and you know, when you're talking about the Ulster Scots tradition in particular, it's not that the Ulster Scots tradition isn't celebrated. I mean, we celebrate all the Ulster Scots American presidents, regardless of the fact that they had a deeply checkered history uh, the ones who, well, there were the ones who supported slavery. There were the ones who massacred Indians. Um, in no way, by and large, were our Ulster Scots presidents enlightened figures. And yet we've managed to forget Francis Hutchison, whose philosophy was one of the driving forces behind the American Revolution. If you take our own case, those of us in Reclaim the Enlightenment uh, have for long been totally absorbed uh, with that kind of heroic era of radical thought, new thought, new ideas at the end of the 18th century, which, you know, apocryphally uh, made Belfast celebrated as the Athens of the North. I'm not quite sure whether we were ever as good as Athens, but the proclamation was made. Um, but what actually we didn't really understand was, you know, the grinding and the source of some of those ideas. Uh, and I'll say no more than that, uh, <coughs> When William Drennan, the framer of the United Irish Oath, uh, the framer of that phrase, a brotherhood of affection between Protestant, Catholic, and dissenter, when he was being tried for treason, as part of his defense, he described himself as, amongst others, having been inspired by Francis Hutchison. So, you know, there's a direct line between those ideas. In fact, you could say that phrase, the brotherhood of affection, was a straight steal from Hutchison. Uh, 
<clears throat> so it's all the more important that we look at this man and look at his ideas. And how bizarre is it that he is still described as the father of the Scottish Enlightenment, and indeed he was the father of the Scottish Enlight Enlightenment, um, as professor of philosophy at Glasgow University, where he also incidentally trained many uh, Ulster Presbyterian candidates for the ministry because they could not get a university education in Ireland. And those Presbyterian ministers came back infused with the ideas of Francis Hutchison, and not a few of them uh, became committed to the United Irish cause, or at least to the cause of radical reform. So actually, <clears throat> one of the points of what Philip has done is to put Francis Hutchison in his proper place as the father of the substantially forgotten Irish Enlightenment. And I mean, again, to come to who gets remembered and who doesn't. In Killele, um, where Francis Hutchison was educated at a dissenting academy, who gets memorialized? Hans Sloan, uh, who didn't spend very much time in Killele, uh, but actually went on to go out to the West Indies and to amass an enormous collection of objects of one kind or another, which actually laid the basis for the British Museum. But Hans Sloan was a supporter of slavery, a beneficiary of slavery, in stark contrast to Francis Hutchison, who was an implacable opponent of slavery. Well, Hans Sloan gets a statue, but Francis Hutchison doesn't get a statue. And, you know, one of the reasons we want to publish this pamphlet is to get Francis Hutchison due recognition. And uh, our way of exploring what Philip has been up to is that I'm now going to interview Philip. I'm not a very good interviewer. I haven't done it for years. Uh, but maybe this will help help us explain what we're about. So I'll get my wee questionnaire off the floor here. A very good evening to you. Hello, John. I hope everybody can hear it okay. Yes. Good, good. That's, that's the first, first crucial issue. Yes, the whole system seems to be working. Thank you, yeah. Terry and engineers. I made a complete mess of two meetings this afternoon on Zoom, and this one seems to be working. Philip, you're from County Down. But you, in, the, in the blurb you gave us for the back cover, you haven't really told us much about your county down background. Now, I know for a fact, because you led us there, that one of your ancestors, uh, a candidate for the Presbyterian ministry, was executed as a supposed United Irishman. So that's a little bit of your background. But if I'm right, you came from a pretty stern Baptist background where the end of the world was perpetually nigh, but not in quite the sort of way that we would like to see revolutions of one kind or another to actually pro progress human society in this earth. I mean, how did that background influence you? And I mean, I think that, I think that if I look at the people who are members of Reclaim the Enlightenment, uh, or who've joined Reclaim the Enlightenment, many of us have complex histories in which we've actually had to, you know, bump yeah. our past. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, er everyone's history, personal history, is worth untangling. And I suppose as a young fella growing up, um, not far, well, about halfway between Kille and St. Pete, I was probably well placed um, at a later stage in life 
to start to take an interest in someone, i.e. Hutchison, who had been, uh, who had grown up in, um, in, in Sainfield, or in, broadly speaking in that area, with his grandfather, a, a clergyman, like his father had been a clergyman. I too was a clergyman's son, so I suppose there was an identification there once I found out about him. But then he went, of course, to a dissenting academy, um, which was set up for the sons, it would have been the sons in those days, of um, Presbyterian, the Presbyterians and other um, nonconformists. And the dissenting academy in Killale, um had been established by the Hamilton family. Um, and young Hutchison went there. So as I grew up, of course, I would have known very little about that because as, as John has rightly pointed out, my background uh, was very much as the son of a Baptist pastor. My dad was interested in history, of course, but that area of history, 18th century, late 18th century, United Irishmen didn't know too much about it. Um, later on, of course, um, a relative turned up in the house with a family tree, which had been done and which uh, mentioned a young man called Archibald Warwick, who had been um, a United Irishman who had met his fate outside the meeting house in Kirkcullen mm. and um, had obviously been, I soon discovered, to Glasgow University to train as young men did, as John has pointed out, because no third level training was available in Ireland, really, if you were a Presbyterian by background, unless you signed up um, to um, some kind of reconciliation with the established church, Church of England, Church of Ireland. And I, I, at some stage, I can't remember quite when, uh, I decided to go across to Glasgow and investigate this. Um, I met a, a chap who was an academic there and he was able to turn out for me the matriculation record of Archibald Warwick and his signature, which was fascinating. And I really um, yearned to know what it was that took um, young Archibald Warwick, very politically, um, obviously a politically alert, radical young man, into uh, the world that he entered. And uh, I suppose that got me interested in Glasgow University. Um, and then I discovered, I think, uh, as well, um, a Fortnite magazine supplement. Those of us of a certain age remember Fortnite magazine. Uh, and the supplement was edited by Damien Smith. And he had done a remarkable job because he got very interested in Hutchinson. Hutchison, and he'd interviewed different academics around the world and put together a supplement on Hutchison. And my interest was absolutely on fire. I think because I was intrigued to think that out of the countryside that I grew up in, where I, you know, as a kid, stared out on the fields, really. It was a very rural environment. There didn't seem to be a lot way back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s that spoke of world culture, if you like. I here was this man who had really had an influence, as John has pointed out, on American Revolution, influence on um, the Irish Revolution that was attempted in 1798. And here he was growing up where I grew up. And um, that is that was a real winner, I suppose. I mean, I, what I should do is give a little, maybe a little bit of biographical detail about him, and I'll do that in a moment for you because um, I know many of you would know of Hutchison. You may not know the full details, and that's what the, hopefully what the pamphlet will do for you, fill you in. Uh, but um, I was invited by Fergus, who's uh, you know here um, as one of the um, one of the virtual uh, participants tonight. Fergus O'Farrell asked me uh, as a friend way back in in probably about 2010 or 11, to take part in a project that the Think Tank for Action and Social Change was engaging in, in Dublin, TASC for short, and asked me would I be interested in doing a piece. And um, well, many of the articles were about economic and social hard issues. Um, and what I contributed was an article on Hutchison. I got a chance to really explore in depth uh, who this man was, 
Um, and, and that just fired my interest all the more. And you'll find, I think, that the secret chain, which is the, the booklet that uh, hopefully you're all purchasing and will read if you haven't already, it, it owes a very great deal to the original um, task document. I mean, Hutchison, as I said, born and grew up uh, in a Presbyterian family, um, was born in the 1690s, grew up as a young man, went off to Glasgow University to study, and obviously a talented young man, um, came back um, destined for the ministry, if you like, in the early 18th century, Presbyterian ministry. Um, didn't stay in it for too long and found himself as a teacher at Drumcondra Lane, basically, in a dissenting academy in Dublin, and found himself, despite his Presbyterian background, mixing and mingling with a lot of the key thinkers and players, especially around Viscount Molesworth, who was a significant aristocrat in, in, in that um, North Dublin area, and wrote two of the most significant uh, textbooks um, dealing with the whole issue of moral and aesthetic philosophy. You know, what is a good action? Uh, what is a beautiful thing, to, to put it very simply? Um, his talent was very much spotted and uh, he went back to Glasgow University, then became a professor there and subsequently had a, a, a pretty stellar career, I think. At one level, he was working with many of the, the young men who were coming across to Glasgow, um, naive young men who were over there to get an education. I befriended them, taught them. He was what you might call an extracurricular teacher as well, delivered some of the talks to um, the ordinary folk who would come to hear him in English, uh, which was significant. Um, the the um, scholarly language was Latin. And um, became a, a teacher to a uh, friend of people like David Hume, one of the greatest philosophers of all time. And uh, one would venture to say Adam Smith, perhaps one of the greatest economists of all time and a number of others as well. He came back to Dublin to die in the 1740s, a relatively young man. Uh, and that's where he kind of enters obscurity in his native land, I think. Uh, we now know through the work of people like Fergus Whelan that he's buried in uh, at what would be a fairly unmarked grave just north of the River Liffey. And now an attempt has been made to put a blue plaque up that would remember him. Likewise, something similar in St. Field, a blue plaque there on the Presbyterian Church. Um, and there are various other attempts to kind of re-invoke uh, his memory because he is an interesting man. And nowadays, I think, as compared, say, but even when I was working with Fergus on the, the task <coughs> project, there's a lot more interest if you go and put in Francis Hutchison with your chosen topic, you'll find that there's quite a bit of interest. What there isn't is a statue or some other public memorial to him in either the north or the south of Ireland. And that seems to me like an, like an absence. I hope that sets things in, in, in a framework, John, yeah? That sets the scene. Um... Of course, long before you really started uh, exploring Hutchison, uh, you had to make a living. And I gather you were a teacher uh, of drama and English. And one thing about Hutchison is his philosophy with regard to the treatment of children. Mm. Essentially thought children were essentially good and did not require punishment, yeah. required encouragement in the teaching milieu that you went into. How far did you find Hutchesonian principles observed? <laughs> That's a really good question, especially as I have, I can see here a former colleague of mine um, joining us and I can see a former, presumably a former student of mine as well. Um, Actually, I taught for a long period in a Quaker school. Uh, and that was, um, I think, a, an interesting place because, um, you know, the aspirations of the Quakers 
are guided very much by the notion that there is that of God in every man or every woman. Uh, and, and that goes back, to, of course, to the Quaker origins in the 17th century. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that t tallies a little bit with what I think Hutchison believed. Um, what I would say is that, I mean, I would like to read a little bit just from the pamphlet, if you don't mind, uh, which, which points up Hutchison's attitude to children. I think this ties in very much with his whole sense that human beings have a great capacity for virtue, a great capacity for goodness. I mean, he would have automatically had to sign up to the Westminster Confession of Faith, I would have thought, or at least assent to it. So, you know, he, he would probably not, he may well not have wanted to indulge in thinking about the, you know, the, the, the notion of original sin that all human beings are tarred by, by, by sin uh, right from the word go. But um, I, I think it's pretty clear that like a lot of Enlightenment figures, he observed in human beings the capacity, a great deal of intelligence, a great, a great deal of capacity, not just for intelligence, but for emotion and for goodness. And, and you know, he, he notices in children the ability to think and care for other children. Now we know, of course, and then that there's there's more to it than that. I mean, I was walking past a, a parent the other day, and this child, obviously, you know, tantrum and ring was yelling and screaming. Um, so, you know, children obviously are capable, like all human beings, of both bad and good, if we want to call it that. But like a lot of Enlightenment figures, he he wanted to point out that like the world itself, the world itself is full of interest. It's full of um, understandable principles. Isaac Newton had pointed out, for example, in, in, in back in the 17th century, key enlightenment figure, that the world is understandable, that, that, that it boils down to mathematical principles and it can be observed functioning as, as something that had been authored by God. And likewise, I think, um, you know, many enlightenment figures saw in human nature some of the basic principles for morality. So um, what he has to say about children is really poignant because his own children, bar one, died before him, predeceased him, like a lot of people in that age. Um, that's what happens through infant mortality. But here's what Hutchison had to say, and then I'll make a, one or two comments as well that are from the, the pamphlet. Observing the sentiments of children they always passionately interest themselves on that side where kindness and humanity are found and detest the cruel, the covetous, the selfish, or the treacherous. How strongly we do we see their passions of joy, sorrow, love, and indignation, even though there's been no pains taken to give them of ideas of deity or laws or a future state. That's pretty revolutionary to you know, a, a hyper-Calvinist uh, who would really be emphasizing very strongly you know, that human nature is, is, is corrupt and has to be, you know, has to be changed and, 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 and altered by um, admission to um, God's grace, that there is a grace in human beings um, that, that permits that. You know, so he, he talks about the kind of affections that children have, um, talks about childhood as an important period time period. And I'm really fascinated um, in, in recent times to think about how that influenced one of the key educationalists in Belfast in the late 18th century or earlier perhaps. And that's, of course, David Manson. And David Manson, we know uh, frustratingly little about, except that he came from a fairly humble background on the coast of County Antrim. But we know that he, he founded uh, an academy um, to teach in Belfast. And that amongst the star pupils, if you like, are both Henry Joy and Marianne McCracken. And um, one of the things that, that Manson talks about is teaching children by amusement. Now, the word amusement has, has, has moved a little sideways to us, you know, uh, as a word, but I think. Uh, in, in, in that period, it would have meant through pleasure, through enjoyment of what you were doing. 
not through strict Ireland instruction, but through encouraging enjoyment of what you were doing. And so I think we can see there a classic example of how Hutchison's and indeed other Enlightenment thinkers' thoughts about childhood come through. There advanced, there's advanced thinking going on. Um, and of course, modern educational ideals have very much switched across towards teaching through enjoyment. You talk to any primary school teacher and I think that's, that's what they'll say. Um, I think also one other thing, if you don't mind, John, me mentioning is that, um, and I did mention this uh, when we launched the original task pamphlet uh, to the Sorry. audience. Sorry? I was having me back. Technical difficulties over here. Um, the power just went off on the laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Just give me a wee, uh, five minutes. Sorry about that, Bob. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes we can hear you, Philip. <clears throat> yes. Everyone's able to hear you okay. Do you want me to just fire what? ahead? Three, three, two, four. Three, Well, it's still going on, so. <laughs> I'm happy to continue if you want. Let's go on. Man. <laughs> Sorry. Technical. Go ahead. I'll just go ahead, shall I? Yeah. Um, one of the things, of course, that the, um, when, when we launched the original cast pamphlet to an audience of, of the Irish president, uh, uh, Higgins, uh, one, of the, one of the things that he picked up on uh, was a comment that I'd made in the pamphlet about how it is that this thinking about progressive education wasn't on the um, wasn't on the curriculum of teacher training colleges, you know. And uh, well, why not? Here's a great Irish thinker who's um, providing thoughts back hundreds of years ago about how children's education has to be rooted in enjoyment. And, I mean, there's been a sad history, I think, um, both sides of the border, of teaching being undertaken in a very severe manner. I've only got to think about one particular friend who, who and I, I, I don't hesitate to mention this, I've been brought up in a Christian Brothers environment in a school in, 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 um, in County Armagh and had been, as he put it, um, beaten to within an inch of his life um, at various stages. So um, I, I think what Francis Hutchison has to say is interesting uh, from different points of view about the, the role of children. I'm going to hold on to be see what happens here, if you don't mind. Yeah. There, that's a bit now. <laughs> okay, is, is John able to join us or shall I just continue or what? Yeah. People, are you able to hear Fergus? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll fire ahead anyway with um, some thoughts, if that's okay. Um, Philip, can, can you hear me, Philip? I, I can, yes. Right, I was going to move on. You, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you left teaching. Any reason why? Um, I was uh, probably um, shattered, <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> okay, um, that'll do for a reason. And you went into you went into uh, community work. Yeah, uh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I suppose I kind of drifted into it, but I, I ended up thoroughly enjoying it. Um, a lot of this involved work with loyalist communities. Um, and I suppose an, an intro for me in that regard was some work I'd done in First World War history. I'd interviewed a lot of men in, who'd been in the First World War, both sides of the Irish border, of course, and wrote a couple of books, one um, about the Battle of the Somme and about the Battle of Gallipoli also. But, uh, you know, I began to see that the, the whole story of the Somme was becoming very much a, a story of choice, a kind of almost like a piece of mythology for, for many communities in, in Belfast and, and across the north of Ireland. And um, I got intrigued by that. And, and um, it gave me an, a sort of an, a role in there to, to, to become a bit of a informal historian working with community groups on, on a bunch of issues. And of course, what I did as part of that was very often to take groups of loyalists and the Republican sometimes mixed groups on tours of 1798 sites and to talk to them uh, quite a bit about people like Hutchison as well. And I find a warm and intrigued welcome for that. I'm sure you still do in the in the work that you do in trash and I don't know how to pronounce your um, your group. My Irish is, is poor. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure that the kind of work that still goes on um, in, in terms of tours is still crucial. I mean, tours of the center of Belfast, um, the forgotten alleyways were in places like the Crown Tavern. Um, the United Irish Movement has its origins, um, County Down, County Antrim, and further afield. And indeed, of course, in Dublin and in the counties that, that rose in 1798 and so on and so forth. So yeah, um, the work with the loyalism sometimes carried over into looking at the kind of topic we're looking at tonight, yeah. Uh, Philip, you've also, why did you turn to drama? Did you think that that added an extra element of possibility in bringing people to exploring difficult issues? Yeah, I, I certainly was uh, very much involved in that. Yeah, the, the role of drama is um, a part of part of my, his, my my background as a teacher, I guess. And I did a number of projects. I mean, one that some may know about is um, I did a, a series of projects with um, former members of the security forces here in, in, in Northern Ireland who had suffered from PTSD, which many have done, and, and did quite a bit of work. Um, endeavoring to tell the stories with their permission of what they'd been through and what their experiences were. Um, and that, that to, to my mind, was a, a worthwhile thing to do, involving theatre and, you know, encouraging responses from a chosen audience as well. Um, so, yeah, drama. I also think, by the way, that there's room for some kind of drama about Hutchison. You know, there's room for more drama to deal with that period. What I did do, um, some folk here may remember it, um, back uh, in, in um, quite a few years ago when I was teaching in Down Patrick, I was involved in a project where we um, took the story of Thomas Russell uh, and the, the site of where he was in jail in the last few days before he was hanged. And um, we, we performed a play with a group of young people um, subsequently, a few years later, with a, a young former student of mine, we did a one-man show on Thomas Russell. We performed it in the Linen Hall Library, which, of course, John, you know well, and which has a, an important ancestral, ancestral relationship with the United Irish. Uh, we performed it in different venues. And, and I think drama does, does create ways, if you do it interactively, and allow the audience the opportunity to discuss what they've seen. Uh, it, it, it has enormous fertile capacity to affect uh, the kind of openness that Hutchison was talking about. You know, um, I mean, Hutchison has a view of human nature which is benign, 
it's not that he isn't aware of what's bad in human nature and what humans are capable of. I mean, he grew up with a grandfather who had been through the worst of the Scottish experiences of um, religious wars. You know, in Killalay, where he grew up as I, and went to, to, to school, so to speak, you know, there were, there were memories still in people of the religious wars and the, of the 17th century, deep memories of horrible things that had happened. So he was well aware, I think, of, of what humans are capable of. But that sense of the possibility of, of human virtue and, and the need for a political structure to allow that potential to be fulfilled, I think is a, a key part of Hutchison. And, and I would greatly, um, I would hope that, although we don't know if Hutchison went to plays, drama, I would hope that he would uh, approve of a dramatic rendering of his life and its significance. You mentioned there that Hutchison was born. Sorry, you mentioned there that Hutchison was born in 1690. And well, 1690s that, and the 1690s, yeah. Yeah, um, and you know that was the period when many of the Ulster Scots had actually, within their own lifetimes, fled from Scotland in the face of oppression. The Covenanters, is that right? Well, yes, to some degree. Um, I mean, the, 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 the point I was going to make is that, in other ways, Presbyterians uh, were legislated against in Ireland. How, how far do you think that Hutchison's specific Presbyterian background influenced his philosophy? Yeah, well, I mean, he represents a, a, a turn inside Presbyterianism and one that um, still exists in a, in a small fragment, I think, of Presbyterianism in, in Ireland still today uh, in, in, in the shape of the non-subscribing tradition, which would see itself as being in, in, the, um, in the tradition that goes back to, to Hutchison. Um, I think... Um, so there's a turn, you know, it's about the Enlightenment period, and Hutchison is one of many figures in, in Europe and in, in America and in Ireland and Britain uh, who are imbibing and articulating a new view of human nature that I've kind of touched about, I touched on a little bit in the last few minutes. But you could say that, um, that one of the features of Presbyterianism uh, is the way in which, for one thing, there's a highly educated ministry. There's a big emphasis on an educated, trained uh, clergy. There's, secondly, there's a real influence, um, sorry, there's a real emphasis on literacy. It's about reading the Bible. It's about getting to know the Bible. And the sacramental tradition is there inside Presbyterianism. But the key thing is the knowledge of the Bible, the instruction of the Bible, because it's through an understanding of what scripture says that you are able to make a journey of faith, as we would now perhaps call it nowadays. And I think that is um, that seriousness uh, is fundamental. And I think also, you know, there are people inside the Scottish Presbyterian tradition already, like Samuel Rutherford in the middle of the 17th century, who are, who are mining the Bible for democratic ideals. That's really interesting. There's a book I read called Rex Lex, The Rights of Kings, basically, that, uh, that Rutherford produced. And he's a Covenanter Presbyterian. Uh, and, and what he's saying in there is, look, in the Old Testament of the Bible, um, it's pretty clear that kings are only a stopgap because the people in Israel want it. Uh, they're not the natural way. And if kings like Saul or David or whatever don't uh, follow in the right way, and don't follow the people's needs, if you want, um, it's perfectly legitimate to, to ditch them. And I think that, you know, that's a forgotten, um, perhaps a slightly forgotten tradition inside Presbyterianism. But then, um, uh, you know, I think it, 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 it feeds into um, a, a, a kind of, what we would now kind of certain bullshiness inside the Presbyterian psyche, you know? Um, you know, if, if you're, which you still see today, I think, even in very fundamentalist, maybe Presbyterian churches, you know, if the minister doesn't uh, follow the, um, the guidance of the congregation, doesn't please the congregation, well, he's in trouble. So um, I, I think this feeds into some degree 
into Hutchison, uh, Hutchison's ideals about dogma and about, uh, and about dogmatic leaders. He argues very clearly that despotism is against human nature. It's bad for human beings to be under a despotic rule. And of course, that ties very much into what people read of him in America when he became a popular writer in America. Um, yeah, despotic rule is bad. It's bad in, in every way. And it, it, I see a little link between that and what Samuel Rutherford is saying as a Presbyterian scholar in the middle of the 17th century. I think too, you know, uh, when, when we talked about the, the, the Quakers a moment ago, and you know, the right uh, to, to recognize the, that which is of God in every man, I, I think that also, you know, there is potential for Hutchison to acknowledge not just, yeah, the capacity of humans to err and go wrong, but also that there is that inside them which is uh, an echo of the divine, the capacity to be good, to think about others, to care about others, and to acknowledge virtue. I mean, one of his big contributions we haven't quite touched on, but is he, he sees other senses other than the five senses that we know about. He sees other senses, a sense of honor, a sense of ridicule, and most importantly of all, a sense of morality. That there is a moral sense in human beings. Now they may differ about what's right and wrong, but they have a capacity innately to think in those terms, in moral terms. And of course, that is, is fundamental uh, to feeling that humans have the capacity and the dignity to participate in democratic government. And that is really at the heart of what um, the thinking and, you know, the thinking that comes into United Irish policy, you know, a brotherhood of affection of one another. They can live cordially together. Um, it, the, the United Irish movement thinks in terms of a parliament for everybody, all male, of course, in those days, but um, that's a whole other story. Um, a parliament for all of Ireland, where everyone has a chance to vote. Um, that kind of thinking depends on the notion that humans are capable of voting that they have the capacity to think about one another in a brotherhood of affection, and they have the capacity to discern right and wrong. You know, you can't think um, that that isn't a really important part of, um, of, of the Hutchison legacy. Yeah, go ahead. So, John, have you any more thoughts, or shall I continue? Yeah, um, well, I was thinking you, I was sort of, uh, one of my questions was, you know, Hutchison didn't come from nowhere. Uh, and, you know, what previous influences, I think you've half answered that, um, uh, referring to some of his Scottish forebears who were already thinking thoughts somewhat along the same lines. Would that have been the major influence or were there any prior Irish influences? Um, there, there's, a, there's a range of influences. I mean, I think when he is part of a circle of people who are thinking uh, and writing together in, in the Dublin area under the ages, in many ways, of Viscount Molesworth, um, that includes people as magisterial as Dean Swift, for example, of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, I think that um, that is a big influence on him. But, uh, you know, there's a wide range of influences, I think, with Hutchison. And, uh, you know, his own teacher, uh, John Simpson, for example, uh, at, at Glasgow University, um, was broadcasting some of this thinking, you know, that humans have the capacity for virtue and we have to acknowledge that. I got into trouble for it and, and was regarded in many ways as a heretic. Um, Gershon Carmichael, who had been a professor of philosophy um, before, um, before Hutchison took on the role, a significant influence. Um, the friends that he had who were touched by the same thinking, like people like Tom Drennan's, the father of, um, of William Drennan, a lifelong friend. Um, William Bruce, who was a cousin of his, who helped publish him in Dublin, a significant person. 
Then you've got to think about other philosophers like John Locke, 1690s, a famous date in, in, in local history in the North of Ireland, but it's the date of uh, John Locke's inquiry into human and, and essays about, um, about human uh, understanding. You know, the, a key the Enlightenment figure is John Locke. Um, you have Shaftesbury, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, who, you know, in many ways articulates the idea of human virtue and that humans have the capacity to do good. Very, very significant. I mean, I think also that um, Hutchinson's reactions against certain thinkers are just as important as his, his arguments for them. And one of the people that he argues against, for example, is, John, is very much um, uh, the, the influence against Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes, it's, of course, the Leviathan is one of the great texts that he wrote. And Hobbes, not perhaps to overgeneralize, but I mean, I think Hobbes' argument is that human beings are fundamentally self-serving and that you need a strong, perhaps an autocratic government in order to make sure that, uh, you know, a monarchy, <laughs> preferably in Hobbes' terms, in order to ensure that things um, stay peaceful. It's, it's written during the Civil War, of course, a time of enormous conflict. But, you know, it was arguing against Hobbes' view that Hutchison came to some significance. But I think if you look at the pamphlet um, that we have, um, you know, the pamphlet that we're celebrating tonight, and you look at the picture in the front of it, you will see a picture here of, um, by Alan Ramsey, the famous portraitist in, in, in Scotland. And there is a book that he's clutching in his hands. And that book is significant. If you're going to be, have a, a, a painting done of you and you're holding a book, it's significant. And I don't know if you know what the book is, but the book, uh, as I understand it, is a book by Cicero. Um, uh, and of course, Cicero uh, was what they called an academic skeptic. It's an academic skeptic. skeptic. In other words, it was part of a movement in classical times to ask that we should not take anything for granted, but that everything should be open to inquiry and to debate and discussion. I think that is really potent as a picture. Um, but it's not the only classical influence. I mean, Hutchison wrote and translated the works of Marcus Aurelius, famous, um, a famous scholar, but also an emperor in, in, in ancient Rome, and famous for being a Stoic. And of course, Stoicism or the Stoic uh, tradition um, is it, a really, um, it's a really important one, and um, you could say that it emphasizes human virtue um, and, and, and the idea that it's our behavior, not just our words, that matters in the practice of human virtue. So I think there's an array of different influences there, from friends right through to um, Scottish influences. So just you know the influence of some of the great philosophers like like um, like John Locke, yeah. Of course, uh, the interesting thing is to think then about his influence on others and how he, he, he you know how he still has an influence today. But I don't know whether you want to open up that to the questions, John. <laughs> Put the mic up, John. Your mic, sorry. He seems to have come close to abandoning the concept of original sin, did he? Um, uh, from what I can hear that you're asking about original sin, you know, um, I think I touched on that earlier. I don't think Hutchinson ever wants to talk about that. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, what he's interested in is the human capacity for virtue. And I think it's a reaction against the excesses of the 17th century where um, any notion of, of human fallibility or, or, you know, has become erected into uh, a story about um, human, human capacity and incapacity for doing good. And, you know, he's seen so much, um, as I think I've touched on, so much evidence that humans fight one another over religion and over dogma, that he wants to see, um, a, he wants to see a very, wholesome uh, faith. He wants to see a religious faith as a thing that elevates and does justice to human nature. And then that's the thing to say. And of course, we have to remember, if, if you're thinking this is all very religious language, well, of course it is. Of course it was. And of course, the leaders in so many places 
of the United Irish men were clergy. They were clergy, you know, and, and um, cases were taken against many of them. Some ended up like Porter and Warwick with a noose around their neck. Others uh, ended up um, being uh, sent abroad um, and to, uh, or, or traveling abroad to America. So, you know, I think one of the things we have to say is that religion plays a key part in the United Irish movement. Um, now, you could argue that Hutchison, you know, there's a secular component or a secular drift in what he's saying about human virtue. Um, but you have to say that even if you look at Thomas Russell, I mean, Russell in the last few days of his life in jail is arguing about religion. He, he's convinced that the end of the world is coming soon and that Jesus is coming back to Ireland. He's just read a pamphlet by Francis Dobbs that, that argues this. And so he, he, you know, he, he spends his last few days in jail hoping that what he's doing by way of attempting to resurrect the United Irish project um, is going to hasten the end of the world and the coming of the millennium. So I think one of the things we have to, to, to take on board when we think about this period is the influence, not of some of the kind of dogmatic, harsh religion uh, that well, sometimes in, in Northern Ireland we've all been all too familiar with, and certainly I was, uh, but the influence of uh, a religious temperament that seeks to, to do justice to the best in human nature and to see... Um, and to see that a project of um, dealing with human affairs, reforming, getting rid of despotism, that's part and parcel of the, the, the United Irish project and indeed a project in America as well. Of course, it um, seems to me that uh, um, <coughs> if you uh, do not emphasize original sin, you can move on from that. Um, to saying that there's no need for oppressive government. Um, is that an appropriate connection with regard to Hutchison's philosophy? And what John's saying, if you can hear there, is you know, one of the corollaries perhaps of, of the absence of um, an emphasis on original sin is that there's not the same need for, for oppressive government. Well, I mean, what I've said about Hobbes there is an argument for oppressive government, that humans are so capable, uh, you know, incapable of, of of naturally doing good, um, that you know that requires stern hands at, at the tiller, so to speak. Um, I think um, what is particularly interesting, perhaps, are, are, is some of the case studies of how Hutchison's thinking in this regard play out in history. So, I mean, I, I, I've talked to you earlier about children and um, referred to a little bit from my pamphlet, but. I'm, I'm interested in just some places in the pamphlet here where it touched on the influence on America. Um, Hutchison had written quite explicitly um, that, you know, people, and I'm quoting from Hutchison here, have the right of defending themselves against the abuse of power. If any citizens with permission of the government leave their country and at their own expense find new habitations, they may justifiably constitute themselves into an independent state. If the mother country attempts anything oppressive towards a colony, the colony is not bound to remain subject any longer. You can see how that was manna, you know, that was meat and drink to those um, such as um, that we know about, uh, the, the Thomas Jefferson, Franklin and others, who were in the colonies on the east coast of the Americas and were yearning to break the bonds, really, of what they saw as oppressive British practice to do with taxes and to do a range of other things. So um, Hutchison then became very widely read in, in the Americas. Um, we know that, um, for example, you, even just if you look at the diary of some of the, the great figures like John Adams, a significant um, president in the early days of the United States when it became an independent country, Adams talks about reading with pleasure the works of, of Hutchison. We know that um, in, in one particular academy in, in America, um, which was at, at which Francis Allison taught, there were three future signatories of the Declaration of Independence. And of course, Allison had been a scholar at the Glasgow University for a time alongside Hutchison and knew him well. 
and had imbibed, I think, a lot of the ideals of Hutchison and, and read them. And, you know, plenty of evidence in there, if you look at the pamphlet, that, you know, he was a key, his thinking was key to the, um, the ferment that happened in the United States, the future United States. One thing I think that's worth bringing up here, and I'm maybe nipping ahead a little bit, and I'm conscious of the time passing by as, by as well, John, but um, one key thing is, if you look at Francis Allison, who was a teacher who imbibed a lot of Hutchison's thought and taught it um, to, um, to future signatories of the uh, Declaration of Independence. As a man, he kept slaves. And he uh, um, freed them when he, um, you know, as part of his will when he died. But we know of other key figures in the American Enlightenment, if you like, who kept slaves. Uh, and I think that's a very potent and a very um, powerful thing because, you know, Hutchison's writings uh, speak very much against that. Now, um, I, I can quote a little bit um, that, that will give you a sense of Hutchison's of opposition to slavery. Um, he says at one stage, as the notions of slavery which obtained in the Grecians and Romans and in the past, they're horribly unjust. No damage done or crime committed can change a rational creature into a piece of goods, void of all right. The idea of natural rights, all human beings have rights um, and incapable of acquiring any rights. You know, you can't if you're a, you know, a chattel slave, you're a slave. Um, and you can receive any injury whatsoever from a proprietor. In other words, a slave owner can do what he wants with a slave, treat him as property, injure him, treat him abominably, because that human creature doesn't have natural rights. And that's what Hutchison's arguing for. And of course, it doesn't seem to have got through, you know, to, to, to so many people. It didn't get through to David Hume, who was a great philosopher and influenced in so many ways by Hutchison. We know that David Hume, for example, dabbled in slavery. His, his, his mentor, the Earl of Hartford, got advice from Hume and facilitated about purchasing that slave plantation on the island of Grenada in the West Indies. We know that Sloan, Hans, Hans Sloan, that you referred to earlier, John, I mean, Sloan's wife had a fortune based on slavery. And I think, you know, what we're beginning to see uh, is the ways in which Hutchison, uh, in his arguments, is kind of ahead of his time. Like, like you know, now he did influence Adam Smith, and, you know, Smith was opposed to slavery, and there were those who were opposed to it. But many people that had imbibed, you would think, Enlightenment principles didn't seem to, to, to work out that these apply to every human being, you know. Um, I just quote again uh, what Hutchison's saying about religion and slavery. Strange in any nation where a sense of liberty prevails and where the Christian religion is professed, custom and high prospects of gain can so stupefy the consciences of men and all sense of natural justice, that they can hear computations made about the value of their fellow men and their liberty without abhorrence and indignation. Now, that's a castigation of a Christianity that takes no interest whatsoever in, 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 the, in, in the individual liberties and rights and equality of those from a different culture, ethnicity, as we would now call it, and background. And I think that's where we bring Hutchison in. You know, I think in one of the questions you've been thinking of asking, John, was, you know, has his time come at Hutchison? But in some ways, the Black Lives Matters project uh, has alerted all of us, I think, to the whole issues of how in, in the, um, if you like, in the infrastructure, in the bedrock of so much of the culture of the West, way back, there has been this, uh, profiting from slavery and a and, and failure to acknowledge it, you know. And of course, in Bristol, we saw what happened with the statue of Colson going into the water. Um, and I suppose if we're talking about statues here, we talked about a statue to, uh, to give some evidence of Hutchison's worthiness. I think it amplifies our sense 
that that Hutchison deserves um, some commendation. So, um, yeah, and uh, what's interesting to think as well is that people like Hamilton Rowan, Archibald Hamilton Rowan, who um, again from Killalay Castle, a Killalay man, a uh, United Irishman who helped found the Dublin branch of the United Irishmen, really interesting figure, goes to America because he has to go in, in the early and in, in during the 1790s because he, he's, uh, he's in trouble for pamphlets, United Irish pamphlets that he's producing. And one of the things he says that he can't stand about America is, uh, he, and then by this stage, it's America, uh, an independent United, you know, an independent American now in, in the, towards the end of the 18th century and the early 19th. He said two things I can't have. One is the treatment of Negroes, in other words, the treatment of slaves. And the second is the treatment of the native people. In other words, um, what we would as children have called the red Indian culture, you know, the, the, the culture of the native or um, indigenous people. And I find that interesting that there is a scene uh, stretching through from Hutchison to Hamilton Rowan and further on through uh, into other interesting figures of respect for the dignity of all human beings. Um, when Olada Equiano comes to Belfast and comes to the docks where the church is tonight and um, reads from and tries to sell his book about being an enslaved African, uh, one of the key texts, you know, in the early days of um, the, the attempt to emancipate uh, those who were enslaved, and when Frederick Douglass comes to, to, to Belfast, as he did to the rest of Ireland uh, later in the middle of the 19th century, as a former slave, um, that they're turning up in a place that had a tradition, as we know the United Irish Movement did have, of opposing the slave trade in Belfast and slavery, even though some people in Belfast in the 18th century were like other cities and towns in Ireland making money from slavery. Um, so um, I, I think that's a, a, a delved forward, forward into another topic area really, but I thought it was one that's really important to mention tonight in terms of the relevance of this man and what he represents. Um, Philip, uh, as I said in my introduction, um, Hutchison is still referred to as the father of the Scottish Enlightenment. Why do you think he was forgotten in Ulster and sort of mid 19th century. So John's asking here, um, for those who uh, can't quite pick up the volume there, um, why, was, uh, why was Hutchison forgotten? Why does he get remembered as the father of the Scottish Enlightenment? Why, um, why the long absence? I think part of it is because there is a change in, in Presbyterianism in the 19th century. I mean, for a start, it, it, um, it comes in from the cold. It comes in from its marginal role, I think, um, that I referred to earlier, you know, as, as uh, the legacy of, uh, of nonconformism, a legacy of dissent, being a dissenter. And it becomes a, a, a key player. So much so that by the time you've got to the Ulster Covenant of 1912, it's a Presbyterian document in many ways. A uh, key Presbyterian layman um, is, is, is the significant guy in writing it. And when it comes to the Northern Ireland Parliament being established in its early years, it settles in the, um, the seminary that we came to know as Union College or Assemblies College. And what that journey is about, I think, is in part through, a, through the influence of key, key, key players. Um, it's partly because I think um, Nonconformism moves to the centre of British society by the middle of the 19th century. But also there are key players like um, the Reverend Cook, uh, who becomes a significant player in, in, Presbyterianism, in Presbyterianism in the mid-19th century. And for someone like Cook, Hutchison would have been a heretic. Simple as that. He would have been a heretic. And um, because of his views. And, uh, you know, I heard that word subsequently, 
when I went to little his historical groups around um, Northern Ireland and talked about Hutchison, I heard people say, oh, that man's a heretic. And that wasn't merely about ideological difference or religious difference. It was about Bruff. this man is leading um, human beings in an evil direction towards hell. And it's interesting when we put that blue plaque up in the same thing, what intrigues me is that the, who, well, the man who was the minister at the time in the church said that he was very glad to see um, this plaque going up because of the grandfather who was a sound, uh, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but basically his grandfather was a sound Presbyterian. By implications, of course, Hutchison was an unsound one. So I think that accounts for, for some of it. But I think also, you know, I mean, if you consider that he, he, he goes invisible in Dublin as well, that's important. And I don't think that has so much to do with um, the, the growth of a kind of, a certain kind of pro-Tory evangelicalism inside Presbyterianism in the North. It may be also to do with just the, the journey that Ireland is on, you know, towards independence, um, towards, you know, and the traumas of the famine, so many factors that, um, that become important. And that kind of nucleus of uh, that little group of thinkers around Viscount Molesworth, that little group of thinkers, they come kind of marginal to the, to, to the journey that, um, that Ireland is on towards independence, I suppose. Uh, that a, a tumultuous and terrible journey through the period of the famine and so on. Um, but what is interesting there for me is I think I see, and, and Fergus was influential in my thinking about this, I think I see in Daniel O'Connell and Daniel O'Connell's work, not only the influence of that um, positive attitude to uh, to human dignity that, um, that informs O'Connell's attitude to slavery and links him with Frederick Douglass. But I think also, when you look at what um, O'Connell was doing, he was bringing people together in mass meetings, you know, with the monster meetings as they sometimes got called, in the faith that human beings who don't know each other it can be brought together in a cause. And that is all about the notion that human beings have that brotherhood of affection in them. They have that capacity to identify with one another, to see what's right and what's wrong, and to, to, to bond together in order to try to achieve good. We know too that O'Connell uh, was implacably opposed to violence as such. That's a whole other story as well, you know, but we do know that his work in terms of bringing people together in, in, in those projects like against the union, repeal of the union, relied on that brotherhood of affection. And I would see that as, as you know, what O'Connell did is influential in terms, I think, also of what has subsequently happened, where, you know, mass protests can occur. We see it all the time. You know, if a young woman gets raped, by a policeman in, in London, which happened recently, not too far from where I am now, it, people come onto the streets and social media, though it has its faults, maybe can enable people to do that and to contact one another and bring people together. Um, you know, the, the whole notion of, of the overthrow of tyranny has happened arguably in the former Soviet bloc can very often be about people getting together I remember the scenes in Wenceslas Square in, um, in, in, in the heart of Prague. You know, that capacity to bond together to change in, in faith in human nature and against despotism. Um, I, I think we can see Hutchison, among others, as being philosophers and thinkers. We set the ground rules there and, and you know, for, for what subsequently occurred. I think we've given you a good run here. All I can say is bring the heretic back. Thank you very much, Philip. And Patrick Sabai also says, reclaim the Enlightenment way on the table at the back. Thank you very much for coming.
Um, thank you, Philip. I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah, I mean, we, we could talk on for another um, long period of time about all kinds of stuff to do with a man, but I do recommend that you, 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 you put in Hutchison plus whatever you're interested in into the internet and, and you'll see how he emerges. I mean, his books have been published a lot more widely and much more understood. Go to the Linen Hall Library, that venerable place, and you will see copies of some of his work. Um, he, philosophy can obviously be a highly obscure thing to work with. You won't find it with Hutchison. He's accessible, he's readable, um, and he's, he talks about all kinds of interesting things. His work on laughter is fascinating. What he has to say about comedy and humor, humor is interesting. But what he has to say, I think, um, I'm finishing here, but what I think he has to say that's right on the money uh, in terms of this era of Black Lives you know, Matter is what he has to say about slavery and what he has to say about human rights and about the dignity, the inherent dignity of human beings. And I think that that motivated a lot of those who got involved in the United Irish Movement. Where it ended up in 98 was, of course, tragedy, bloodshed, and all kinds of horror. You know, we can't deny it, thousands died. But what motivated, I think, a lot of um, leaders at that time and ordinary folk who went and took part in, in the whole project um, was something of that sense that, you know, human beings are worthwhile and it's, it's, it's possible to bond together with others to create a better society. And I hope that that, mood, that marries a little bit with what um, Reclaim the Enlightenment seeks. Thanks, Philip. That, that's it. Okay, folks, good, good to see you all, um, you, including you know, a few old familiar faces from long ago. <laughs> Yes, uh, okay. Take good care. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll just close it up there. Thank you.